Okay, thanks very much. My talk was going to be titled The Death of the Web, The Rise and Everything Else, but after further consideration, I think I'm going to title it The Fourth Wave of Manifesto for a Better Web. That'll make more sense as I go. So this is probably a better, a better explanation. Who am I? I am Tim Trask. Um, I have a fairly new resident in the spring, moved down to manage with my wife about two years ago, was previously in Denver, and then before that, uh, Nashville, and originally from South Dakota. I've been doing web dev, digital marketing, all that great stuff for 20 plus years. Made my first GeoCity site in 1997, and have just been sticking with it ever since. I also am managing partner of a group called Realistic. Um, we are a uh, creative advisory. We solve problems for businesses and brands. When I say creative advisory, uh, we're not a consultancy, we're not an agency, we're not a studio, we're not an accelerator, we're some crazy Frankenstein of all those things. And there's not a term yet that really, the, an industry term or a buzz term for that, so we're settling on creative advisory. And it really kind of uh, brings into account all of those things. We can really take a holistic approach to problem solving, really help clients and businesses figure out the why and the who, and then all the, the stuff that we build, the great stuff that's predicated on that. Um, and I've been doing that for about two or three years. Prior to this, I ran a digital marketing agency. So again, I've been bouncing around this stuff for a while. My main thesis today is such, I, the original promise of the web has been co-opted by platform uh, monopolies to take us from an open, secure, connected web to a closed, insecure, manipulated web. And some of this is probably preaching to the choir. <laughs> some of this is probably preaching to the choir, some of this you may bristle against. But I wanted to take, this is more of a, a holistic view, a top level view of, of the web, but also tech in general. We're gonna cover a lot of things that are definitely more broad than just the web, but um, I'm gonna walk through some history too. I like to start with a quote from uh, Tim Berners-Lee, Godfather of the Web. The web as I envisioned it, or envisaged it, we have not yet seen. The future is still so much bigger than the past. And I want to keep this front of mind as we go, because this its you know this has been something that's kind of bugged me for a little while. You know, growing up, uh, you know, kind of in the first, first wave of the web, which we'll talk about, uh, kind of getting my professional start during it. The last couple of years, something's been different. Something's been interesting. I, I, don't, I couldn't put my finger on it for the longest time. And I've been more passionate about kind of what has happened and what we should be doing going forward. So to start with, we're going to take a history, a his, quick history lesson, a quick uh, trip back through time. Um, I don't like using the terms Web 0.0 or 2.0 and everything, but I, I, I liked this graph because it kind of lays out where we started and where we're headed, um, and all the things along the way that you know, all the different technologies, all the different uh, methodologies, companies, and everything. I'm going to instead use a term that I call waves, and, and these waves are interestingly in seven year segments, give or take, and there's always an inflection point that moves us from one wave to another. I'm going to kind of bypass wave zero, which is everything up to you know, the early 90s. I think 93 was an email kind of really started to take in, so I, that's where I start with the modern consumer web. Uh, big shout out to the web before that, everything that came up to that point, obviously very important, but the commercial web, I really like to think about 93 is when we started. And of course, there's so many companies and businesses and brands that were part of that. You probably recognize many of these. Once again, shout out to, to GeoCities right there, good old, old GeoCities. But it was very, you know, it was very much the Wild West. It was decentralized, completely decentralized. And I think you back off of Matthew Barnes' discussion this morning. Um, anybody, anywhere could set up a website, could set up a, you know, any kind of node, a, 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 a forum, a chat, anything. It was experimental. This is brand new. Anything went. You could create a website for any possible thing you wanted. It's very disruptive. Obviously, so many businesses in that first wave. Um, it, you know, Napster came around towards the end of the first wave, and that disruption was really apparent at the end of that. Um, it was iterative, so highly iter uh, iterative in that effect. You know, you could build a web page or website, two days later change it, merge it with something else. There was a, a, a churn to the web that was really interesting. And of course it was brand new. This new shiny thing, you know, remember back in the mid-90s, late 90s, there were people who actually said, oh, this web fad, it will fade, it will, you know, it's, it's not going to be here much longer. And how wrong they were, but it was so new that so many people kind of got gleamed onto it as this interesting, cool thing. Conversely, it was very slow. Um, remember dial-up modems? I'm sure most people here do. That was not very fun. It, even I remember when 56k modems came out. I was like, oh my god, so fast! We can, we can go faster. Yeah, I, was, I came on board in the 288 uh, 
modem days too. So that, that was a long, long time ago. Limited bandwidth. You can only put so much. You, know, you can only pump so much through those pipes. Um, content. You know. Remember again on your dial-up modem, downloading an image, you would have to be like line by line, and you'd sit there and wait sometimes. Downloading a three megabyte song on Napster took forever. Poor business models. You saw Pets.com pop up there, but there's a lot of a lot of you know uh, businesses and websites that were you know just a simple one-to-one -one translation of a storefront to a website, not really thinking it through, not really kind of understanding the full potential of what we had. So many points of failure. A lot of the web at that point was just a dude server in their room somewhere. And if that power went out, the whole you know that whole website, that whole business went out. Co-location facilities came in a little, a little later, but it was still too many points of failure that were too not very protected. And walled gardens. If you remember, AOL's first business model was, hey, you you buy your AOL subscription, and the internet is AOL. You know, we'll curate it for you. We'll give it to you in a way we want. Other services came along too that were very wall, very you know, very insular, and not necessarily open in the way it should be. There was an inflection point at the end of the first wave, as I mentioned. If, it, if we go to '90s to '93 to 2000, what do you think that inflection point was? Anyone? Do you remember the dot com crash? Doom at the end of 2000 to 2001. So all of this momentum, all of this value, kind of built up, and then boom, and a lot of people scattered. And that scattering effect, and I would argue like at each inflection point, it was a great way to sort of clear the cruft and allow a new generation of businesses and brands and ideas to flourish. So off the back of dot-com bust was the second wave, which more or less officially began in 2001 and kind of took us into 2008. The second wave was kind of a, a, a real explosion of ideas and innovation taken from the, you know, the, the lessons learned from the first wave. Let's actually build some real businesses off of this. And you get to you know, all of these companies, there's plenty more, you know, there's too many to fit on the slide, but you kind of see the, the companies that represent the second wave, in my opinion, what they were, what they did, what they brought us. Internet was a lot faster, the web was a lot faster. Highly connected, the right, you know, the first social media sites, Friendster, MySpace, kind of came out. It really taught us what connection or connectivity could be. The idea of rich media popped up uh, quite a bit. Flickr got its start during the second wave. Did got its start during the second wave. The ability to transfer video, you know, YouTube's first iteration pre Google was 2004, 2005. So you've got now video, photos, media at, you know, at a lot faster at the serve at scale. You've got platform services like Flickr, like other sites that let you sort of batch, aggregate different functions or different ideas. There were useful business models. You know, if you look back, some of these were, yeah, but a lot of them were actually set up for really strong, long-term success. A lot of these are still around today, but a lot of them have been either bought or, or killed. Um, and it was database driven. You know, we went from static HTML websites to more database driven, more PHPs coming into, uh, into play, or .NET. It was much more predicated on databases. Even regular websites for artists, entertainment, uh, we went from static to database driven. Of course, along with this, we also have more negatives. It was still desktop based. As cool as the web was during this time, you're still looking at it. Most, of the, most users look at it through a, a single screen on the desktop. It was front loaded. So a lot of that web work, remember how many um, flash sites there used to be. And all of that was rendered on your browser, and it sometimes took a long time. And it, you know, if you had a blazing fast connection, the web was great. But if you were stuck in that 56K or T1 you know, era, uh, it, nah, maybe not so great. So a lot of that, a lot of that data serving, a lot of that responsibility was, was given back to the user. There's a lot of what I'm calling kitchen sink websites. Everything but the kitchen sink. So websites were, they had to put as much into them as possible because they wanted them to be sticky and they wanted that user to get a comprehensive experience. Contrast that today where so many websites are maybe single service or you know, just basic brochure, we're kind of back to brochure sites again. Consolidation and centralization really started to kick in during this wave. Going back to this again, think about how many of these companies were rolled up or merged or, or copied and killed. Um, that really started to rear its head during this time. And then fractured standards, yet again. You know, we had fractured standards in the, in the first wave. Everything from code bases to codecs for video, like, it got a little better, but not really. We were still, I mean, good lord, H.264 video was still not really a standard at this point. And I love, this is my favorite era of the web, just because I kind of came, came up in it, I got my first start professionally in it, um, was able to do a lot of cool things. 
But of course, there's another inflection point. What do you think at the end of 2007 happened that pushed us into the next wave? Anybody? It was a crash. Uh, yes, but that's mainly this this guy. So the web was everybody was kind of building sites for the desktop, orienting business models for the desktop. And in 2007, when this thing hit, it changed all of that. Remember who here remembers WAP uh, or WAP uh, websites? Yeah, yeah. Remember pre iPhone, you had to make a WAP site and you had your regular desktop site and then your WAP site and it was very, 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 very minimal. This changed all that. This, this introduced things like responsive design and uh, all the different use cases and things that came from mobile, which brought us into the third wave. You know, the iPhone came out in 07, but around 09 is when I really started noticing this, this new wave kick in. And I don't have any fancy logos, but everybody just take out your phone and look at the apps on your phone. That is the third wave. Everything from Uber to Lyft to Google Maps to Facebook to Instagram, all of that stuff was third wave web, or third wave web. And it's highly, you know, the reason I didn't put a bunch of logos up here too is because there's so many to count, but everybody's home screen's a little different. We have some shared experiences, but highly customizable in that respect. One thing, and I just, this has no, no bearing on anything, but I, just, I love this graph. When that iPhone came out, there's so many knock-on effects that we don't think about. Um, as a marketer, I'm always interested in this kind of stuff, but you can see when the iPhone came out, like, gum sales dropped, and it's mainly because those choke points at retail, those end caps where you would you know, you'd stand in line and they try to sell you all the little chashki stuff, when you're sitting here doing this, you're not browsing magazines or gum or candy as much as you used to, and you can kind of see that just that track go down. So I use this graph because it's, it's uh, just as a reminder of what, um, as a reminder of what the mobile revolution is truly. It was disruptive to the web and also to other industries. We have unified standards, finally. Um, a lot of stuff kind of came under a unified standard, whether through code, through architecture, through um, scalability. We're at super fast internet now. A lot of people who were, you know, who came onto the, the web back in the late 90s, or 2000s, when it was a little slower, suddenly that phone's a lot faster. Your internet home at, uh, at home, or your home internet is a lot faster. It's a lot mobile, uh, clearly mobile. So like now we can take it with us, we can put it in our pocket, we have, use cases and buying decisions that we can pull out that phone, look at information, we don't have to go and you know, write it down, go home, you know, pull up Amazon, do our research, it's mobile, it's there, it's scalable. So you can take an app, you can scale it out with cloud uh, um, architecture now, you can actually, you don't have to have a co-location facility with 10 servers and you, you're overspending or spending. you can scale up and down, as we all know, it's highly distributed, Better security, now some people may disagree with this, but in a lot of ways compared to where we came from, security is so much better. And there's more content than ever before. Negatively, there's more content than ever before. There's so much out there, we don't know how to filter it, and there's a massive failure in that filtering. It's also highly, highly centralized. So the end of the second wave, we saw some of those, those acquisitions and consolidation, and that just got hypercharged in the third wave. More money, more consolidation. The, the power of the top five or six companies intensified, and that roll-up only helped them get there. Algorithms run amok. Um, we're still dealing with this, but we, you know, we went from a, a web which was static to database and, and, and distributed to now algorithms are running so much of it. Some of it's great. A lot of it is not. You think about everything from social media algorithms to purchase you know, advertising algorithms to anything that pushes you as a user to where you may not want to be consciously. That is not, in my opinion, good algorithm design, nor is it good human-centered design. We went from you know creating businesses and tools and, and websites that really help people do better stuff to now it's just how do we get the most users at scale so that we can you know, uh, sell to Amazon or sell to Google or, or get some big cash infusion, not really thinking about the, the human part of it, and Facebook's the biggest defender. You know, there have been so many people who've come out since 2016, 2017, regretting how they built Facebook, almost as like a, as a casino machine to just you know, subvert human psychology and manipulate people to just stay on a platform. It's not, it's not built for people, it's built for an algorithm to just keep you on, on, on their tool. So psychological manipulation is crazy, and then acquisitions have just gone through the roof. So there's an inflection point at the end of this wave. I don't know if we know what it is. This is the difference between the first wave and the second wave, the second wave and the third wave. 
there was a clear point or a clear demarcation point where it's like, oh, this is where we're going. And it, like I said earlier, it's it almost wiped the board clean for new, you know, new growth to come in, new companies, new ideas, new businesses. I don't think we've had that, and that's the most crucial difference between the first and second, and now the third wave to the fourth wave. There hasn't been that true inflection point to wipe the board clean. We've sort of built into the hubris has kind of grown into the fourth wave. Now the fourth wave began in around 2017. I say that because privacy. Um, concerns really started to rear their head. Um, uh, the idea of breaking up big tech started around 2017. It's only intensified since then. And just sort of this general sense that there's not a lot of new innovation. There's not a lot of new products. It's either you know, Facebook copying everybody else or a bigger company just buying some new cool thing. There's not a lot of, of, of innovation in the way that we had in the first and second wave. And it's created something different in that we've had that haven't had before. It's actually created a tangent. So if you think about Back to the Future and Doc draws that tangent, if they're trying to go back to 1985, the one that they want, you know, Biff steals the almanac and Biff goes back and changes things and now they're in this weird sort of alternate universe. We're in the Biff timeline. So the fourth wave has it's begun, but it's not what it should be. It is it has been corrupted into this into this thing that I don't know if anybody has truly grasped yet or if people have really understood. There's, there's, you know, there's things being done, but it's not quite what it should be. So let's, why is that? We've returned to wall gardens, very specifically. So remember when I showed you this second wave set of companies, all of this has been replaced by this. They've either been rolled up, copied, or, or killed, and these companies are now running most of the web as we know it. You could ask, well, what about Slack? What about some of these other things? I'll get to those in a second. But these companies own so much of the web now, it's, it's crazy. Don't believe me. And at the end of 2019, or the third quarter of 2019, this was the amount of apps that were actually available in the App Store. 1.8 million um, in Apple's App Store, and then obviously Android's a bigger footprint globally, so they're going to have 2.5 million. That's how many apps are in the App Store. People are not downloading most of those apps. They're going through the top 20 to 30. Everything else is completely left behind. So those companies are controlling 80 to 90 percent of that. 80 to 80 per 90 percent of this is controlled by those five or six companies. Now Netflix is a little different. They're kind of sui generis, but so they may be, you know, at some point I might throw them up there too. Um, but Google, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft—that's kind of it. And then more wall gardens, we have two devices essentially, if, if you look at total, uh, total engagement, we have two devices that are kind of running the voice game right now. That's it. There's no, you can try to start a voice, uh, you know, voice recognition device or startup today and see how far you get Where before you either have to sell to these guys or completely, you know, accept the feat because you just don't have the money or capital or time to get there. These guys are running the whole game right now. There's also over-leveraged investment. This is an interesting one because only in the last two weeks I actually added these slides based on um, what we've just seen with the market. There's a group called SoftBank and they've sort of cleverly, you know, quietly moved into the market and they have bought and, and invested in so many companies. Their first fund was $100 billion. Their fund too was $108 billion. Backing from Apple, Microsoft and a ton of other investment groups. But SoftBank is the game in town now. They actually have invested in all these companies, and there's actually, there's so many more, I couldn't even fit them on here. Most interesting one, though, if you've been paying attention to the news, we were, <laughs> we were, and that's what kind of got me thinking about SoftBank more, because they put $10.2 billion in WeWork and have to write most of that down now, because WeWork has kind of failed at all levels. Uber's right behind it. You know, California pushing their, their latest legislation made, made this a distressed asset, too. And all the way down, you've got all these companies where they either own them outright or they've invested up to a billion dollars to uh, acquire them or be the majority stakeholder. So SoftBank owns so much of what you see. Remember that, that uh, uh, Wave 2 graph I showed you? Most of those companies are SoftBank companies now. And this is important because where we used to have in the Valley or in any, in, in any city or market where investment was going on, you know, I could have an investment fund, you could have an investment fund, and then maybe we're saying, hey, I'll put in four, you know, four point five million at a, a great valuation, and we kind of go back and forth. SoftBank comes in and says, I'll give you hundred million for most of your company, 
And people are saying yes. So it's crowded out an independent meritocracy of investment. And all of this tech now is wrapped up in software. Exploitation is also a problem in the fourth wave. <sighs> you know, people know something's wrong. They've sort of sensed that social media or just the web in general is not quite what it used to be. It's not what we signed up for. Privacy is increasing. It is an increasing concern. Um, you know, how we use the internet has increased, but what we're using it for is, is very minimal compared to what it used to be. Just the fact that people don't have, a ch feel like they don't have a choice in how the apps use their data, there's a big disconnect there. And then shopping online has gone through the roof too, but it's still, all of these are exploitation standpoints. Think about how much shopping is done online now to where you see ads all the time for stuff that you may not even want. We're all being herded into this algorithmic world that we don't have a choice in. There's also separate internets going on. So we're entering 5G territory. Um, this is from 2016, but this is incredibly instructive. The difference between urban and rural internet on LTE, yeah, in terms of LTE, there's a, there's a disparity there. Obviously, Sprint's a big, uh, a big offender. Verizon's a little bit better, but you can almost take this graph and, and apply it exactly to 5G rollout. And it's creating a, a class system of people with great, fast, robust internet and those with not or without, and it's a rural, urban situation. So there's essentially two internets in the U.S. being created right now. Of course, you've got China, which is a complete, you know, it's, it's on the internet completely. They need to dictate which apps, which websites, which content go through. And as we've seen this week with even Apple, um, pulling certain apps out of the Chinese app store, they get to dictate quite a bit. So the Chinese internet is very different than the rest of the world right now, especially in the U.S. We have different internets uh, appearing. So how do we burn the almanac? How do we get out of the BIF timeline and get back to something that's, that's good, that's interesting, that's, that's useful again? I start with progressive web apps. Does anybody know? Who here is familiar with progressive web apps? A couple of you? It's, it's still fairly new, I'm surprised by it, but they act like traditional web apps, but they're enhanced with modern tech, creating a more app-like experience. Progressive part refers to the fact that they can uh, you know, work on older browsers. Some of the functionalities is, is not as uh, upfront, but newer browsers have it. They, you create your own window, a taskbar, uh, or just run a shortcut on your taskbar or your home screen, so they look and work just like an app would. And then they use uh, Cache API and Index uh, database to store resources and data on your device, so that when you're offline, it still functions like an app. And then iteratively, you can push updates without the user having to download an app or you know, do all that kind of stuff. It's just right there. Um, businesses who've used progressive web apps have a significant improvement in a variety of metrics. Increased time spent on the page, conversions are higher, revenue is higher. This is one of my favorite graphs here. Think about what happens when you have an app, when you go to get an app. And again, think about that graph that showed how many goddamn apps are in the store. So 2.8 you know, million, 1.5 million. You know, here you have to go to the store, find it, click install, accept the permissions, download it. So if you start with uh, you know, a thousand users, you may get down to you know, a couple hundred by the time they actually want to use it. A progressive web app gets you out of that, um, out of that mindset. Direct-to-consumer security is another great opportunity for the fourth wave. Um, these are just a few, ExpressVPN, NordVPN, and then I don't know if anybody uses the Signal texting app, but it's built with security in mind. It's built to be a better replacement for your native texting app, for Facebook Messenger, for Google. So companies are actually going directly to the consumer now and saying, hey, protect yourself with a VPN, protect yourself with, with a well-constructed uh, uh, app or, or tool that really puts you front and center and your data front and center. Privacy as a product is really uh, coming up too. So I don't know if you guys use the Mozilla ecosystem, but there's a lot of cool things going on there. DuckDuckGo, as, as absurd as the name is, is a really great search engine and a really great browser. Privacy first and foremost. There's other plugins you can uh, experiment with. Um, uh, Go Rando was an interesting one I found, which randomly you know, chooses your emotional reactions on Facebook. So it tricks Facebook and actually, you know, pulls you out of that algorithm. Um, this one is really cool too, this hyperface one, so as facial recognition becomes more interesting and more, and, and more invasive, that sort of helps you navigate that system too. So privacy as a product is, you know, it used to be an add-on, now it's an actual you know, core feature, if not the product itself. Really keep your eye on DuckDuckGo because they have a very, very small percentage of the browser market now, but I think that's gonna change as people 
you know, get used to it, you know, get the disillusion of Google, etc. Blockchain's also, I think, a really where we should in the fourth wave be going is blockchain and not just in financial circles. These are a ton of great blockchain companies that are financial that are doing interesting things. So I think this, there is a lot to be uh, gained here. Interestingly, going back to SoftBank, none of these are blockchain plays. So they're putting all this money, all this like traditional stuff, but blockchain is a wide open, I, I think a lot of it is because they haven't, there hasn't been a proven model at scale yet. So there's plenty of opportunity to, to engage in that space, plenty of fresh powders to, to ski down. <sighs> Big question mark is AI. This could be a good thing, this could be a bad thing. I think we've seen examples of both. And so I put it here with question marks in the fourth wave as a great opportunity to, to create a better web, but with a heavy, heavy disclaimer and a heavy caveat of it may, it may not, I don't know. That's, that's another talk for another day. So some predictions. I think there's going to be continued fragmentation. I just, I, at this point, until they break up big tech, I don't think we can get away with it. We're now entering in what, what Scott Galloway, professor at NYU, calls the funnel wars. So we have those same four companies, or five companies, plus Disney, now actively pursuing you and your attention to lock you into their funnel so they can just sell you everything upstream. So think about how many people are firmly in this call, but not this call, or this call, but not this line, on and down it goes. I mean, I have, I have a pixel phone, and Google tries everything it can to stick me in that, that ecosystem, you know, even though I want to use Firefox, use something else, they want me in that, in that Google funnel. Disney's in there too, because with their streaming service and all the stuff they control, it's, it's worth mentioning them. They're getting further into tech and further into what the web is. So fragmentation is going to continue. The elections of the world, the um, Google homes of the world are just going to intensify. I think regional access and connectivity is going to be a, further, a bigger issue than it is now. Think back to that 5G adapt or the LTE adaptation graphic as 5G comes on board and as faster uh, speed uh, in the US becomes more available. You're going to see more um, municipal battles. You're going to see more congressional stuff happening around uh, unified access. This also goes to, to other countries as well. This is where I think the biggest opportunity is. Progressive web apps plus blockchain. I think there's a revolution coming in people developing cool stuff at scale in a progressive web app environment based on blockchain. If you can wrap a business model around that, I think that circumvents a lot of this negative stuff that's built up over time. I think a class system for privacy is coming too. More and more consumers are savvy about their privacy, but not enough. And I think there's going to be those of us who are, are completely tuned in, who understand how to manage our privacy and our data, and those who do not. And those who do not are going to get exploited as, as much as humanly possible by those companies. Something really interesting that I haven't talked about, you know, a lot of the focus is on China and how they sort of dictate the internet. But I tell you, so goes India, so goes the world. At the end of, um, yeah, 2018, look at the jump in just pure data usage in India. Spotify has entered India as of this year. A lot of companies are now getting into India. What used to be like, let's get into China, let's sell to China. I think that eye of Sauron has moved to India in a big bad way. Because um, they don't they have nearly as many regulations, it's a little bit more free market than China is, and they're hungry for it. They're hungry for the content. They have been sort of you know, think about all the things that India has already had that are Western centric that we can just sort of layer businesses and use cases on top of. I think India combined with blockchain and web, progressive web apps is where a lot of money can be made and a lot of the new webs can be forged. And then an AI apocalypse prediction, yeah, probably. I think, you know, AI is still a big, huge question mark. And I, you know, I, I, there are days where I side with Elon Musk and there's days I side with Kurzweil. And I just, you know, there's, it could go either way. I think we really need to be really responsible with it. And when you're building AI products, it's, it's hugely important to just think about where, think about what the fifth wave could be and how much better or worse it could be as a result. I want to come back to that Tim Berners-Lee quote. The web as I envisage it, we have not yet seen. The future is still so much bigger than the past. I really, I really believe in this. I think we haven't, it's still so new. The web as we know it in its commercial form is 30-ish you know, years old. We still haven't figured out what it could be. We've gone through some versions of it. We've, we've had some experiments. Let's make this fourth wave really work for us as a, as a culture, as a, as a country, as a society. I think there's so much more value that's good for humanity that can be tapped, that can you know, create you know, the markets, can, can drive money, drive revenue. 
less, it, as you're working on products and as you're working on projects, really think about this quote and think about what the web could be. And with that, I'm out of time, so thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you.